Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 10th episode in Season 4 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guest on this episode is Christian singer, songwriter, and pastor Steve Camp. We'll talk about his Christmas track, Emmanuel, along with how ministry and the music industry have changed since leaving entertainment to shepherding a congregation. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, and of course, share with your friends. Now, you'll be the death of me is a popular mantra for parents, but a new study found having kids might actually make you live longer. It just depends on how many you crank out. Researchers at the University of Michigan looked at the health records of 276,000 people and found some parents are 5 to 10% more likely to live to 76 than people without kids. That's about three years longer than the global average. But there's a sweet spot. It's only true for people who have two children. If you have more kids than that, you're less likely to make it to 76 than someone who doesn't have kids. The same applies if you only have one child. Now, they're not sure why two is the magic number, but the guy who led the study thinks it might strike a balance between, quote, having a good amount of social interactions and not having too much economic or physical burden. Now, either way, if you want kids and you're doing it for purely selfish reasons, you might want to cap it at two. Or if you have planned to stop at one, you might want to rethink that another baby just might save your life. All right, guys, promised you another very special guest. This one I've been sitting on for about a week. I was I was afraid to, to do much posting about it because of uh, how much of a fan I've been over the years. Uh, I have a great mm-hmm. opportunity to, to, to talk with singer, songwriter, amazing pianist, and, and pastor Steve Camp yeah. the, today. And Steve, it's, it's truly an honor to, to have some time with you today, brother. Uh, thank you, man. Cameron, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's a joy to connect this way. I haven't been doing interviews up until lately, mm-hmm. I, you know, I've been out of it for a while and, and for good reason of pastoring a church and wanted my focus to be there. But man, what a great privilege to talk to you. And thanks for some of the support you've shown through the music and then the new Christmas single as well. But really an honor. So I'm in your hands. However you <laughs> want to lead this discussion, it's it's all good. And I've got to tell the audience here, I, I said, I was uh, telling Cameron <laughs> that when I saw him come on the screen, I, it was a bucket list item for me to shave my head and on Facebook and Twitter and, or X, I guess now and different mm-hmm. things, you can see that. And I shaved my head one day and my wife was like, all right, I love you, but, you know, <laughs> and, and all of my fan, my family here, the church, different ones were like, oh man, we're loving it. But it was just about four or five months ago, she said, I said, honey, what do you think? Should I keep it? And she goes, you know what? I miss your hair. And I said, okay, you've got it. Happy wife, happy life. Right. But looking at you, I may have to visit this uh, this realm again. That's- you know, it, it's really it's really cool. So and a double pleasure to be with you here today. That's cool. Now, now the, the, the Christmas song, Emmanuel, what... What uh, after so many years? What what sparked the interest? Uh, was it maybe the wife or uh, or somebody else nudging you a little bit? No, you know what? It was it was kind of I I've been working on this new record for the past seven and a half years. I don't have a record company. Uh, all of you are the record company uh, to help you know get this out. And you know I I've been writing a lot. It has twenty six songs on wow. it. It's a double album. And, uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to come out with something positive. And I had written this Christmas song a few years back. We'd sung it at our church in a different bit of a different format, just piano and vocal. Uh, but we thought, oh, man, let's, let's open with something really positive. I did a, a version years ago when I was a Spar- was, pardon me, Sparrow Records mm-hmm. uh, on Oh Holy Night, uh, kind of a country Springsteen influence on, on how we did the track. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, you know, what can we do here? And my producer, Tim Miner, I sent it to him and he goes, Oh, let's get in and do it. That was just in August. And we finished it first part of September and got it out. 
And uh, so, so thrilled at people's responses. And it came up last minute. But I thought, what, you know, in the world which we live in, Cameron, you know, I mean, what a crazy time to, to bring some joy to the world, to quote Isaac Watts, uh, back into this Christmas season. And I didn't want to record some of the old Christmas classics. Man, there have been so many gifted singers and artists throughout the years record amazing versions of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I I thought, well, I'd I'd like to be able to write some new Christmas music. So this inspired uh, some others to get involved. And I've got already another three or four Christmas songs put together. I'm hoping we can add another seven songs to this and make it a Christmas album Nice for a year from now. Wow. And, uh, but that's what it was. Uh, you know, Isaac Watts, again, joy to the world. When I survey the wondrous cross, you know, a great pastor in the late 16, early 1700s. And when I was looking for writing the lyric on this song, I came upon some poems that he had written about Christmas mm-hmm. And so I, it's all public domain, so I borrowed a, a line or two from Isaac Watts uh, for this song. And so, uh, I mean, he doesn't know about it. He's with the Lord. But here I thought, wow, to have Steve and Isaac together doing the lyric, I mean, it's <laughs> it's kind of a, a bucket list item for me to be able to mend that se- you know, 18th century with the 21st century here. And that was part of the inspiration. Mostly it was just the great words out of Matthew one twenty three that the angel Gabriel said to Mary and Joseph, uh, you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And what a great hope, you know, for our time. If God is for us, who can be against us, as Paul would say? But Emmanuel, God with us, in the darkness of the world, the light came in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And what a great, joyous message to be able to sing again today. That's right. Now, now, being uh, going from entertainer to to pastor, how yeah how how has that cha- how has that changed? Honestly, not so much your life, but your worldview. How is how has that changed since uh, wow. since stepping off the road? And because I know what pastoring is, I'm a PK myself, so I, I know oh, okay. what the life is. So how yeah. has that changed your your worldview, and how has that maybe affected the the release and the inspiration of the new music? You know what? I've never been asked that question in that way before. So really, really good. Uh, You know, coming out of, uh, I was raised in the church. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in in a Bible church in Wheaton, Illinois, the holy city, the Vatican II, right? I mean, we have more Christian organizations (laughs) there than fire hydrants, I think. (laughs) The Billy Graham Center, Christianity Today, Moody Monthly, and that whole rich area growing up at Wheaton Bible Church. Um, but here it was interesting. I gravitated to, to reading great Christian classics uh, that uh, my dear late friend R.C. Sproul got me started with in the mid-70s. A friend of mine named John Bash, we're friends to this day, um, and he, when R.C. was out of Ligonier, Pennsylvania with the ministry at that time, I met him. I drove out there. I was 20 years old at the time, and he loaded me up with a few boxes of books. Uh, You know, in the mid-80s, I got to meet John MacArthur. He became a mentor and a friend. I served with him on staff at Grace for a while, just about a year and a half or so. In between there, Dr. Stephen Olford, one of the great preachers, revivalists of the time, uh, and then Dick Sumi, who taught at Dallas Theological Seminary alongside Howard Hendricks, Christian Education, so I've I've gravitated to reading the great Reformed writers. People call it today theology from a bunch of dead guys, you know. <laughs> and so it was Calvin and Luther and Huss and Zwingli and Matthew Mead and Solomon Stoddard and Charles Spurgeon and all these great writers. Uh, and then my modern day mentors and heroes of my own life. So I would write songs for these previous albums out of reading great theology and studying great theology. So I was going out to LA on a layover there, Cameron, years ago and doing a tour in Australia, New Zealand. And I called uh, MacArthur on the phone. I said, John, do you have some time? I have an eight hour layover in LAX before I head out to the continent below. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes, yeah, come on by the house. So I came on out, saw him. 
I was pacing in front of him, I think like an expectant mother, just <laughs> nervous as it could be. And I said, I want to ask you something. And he goes, I know what you're going to ask me. And I said, no, you don't. I want to ask you. He goes, yeah, you, you feel called to be involved in the pastorate and you want me to ordain you. I said, oh, my goodness, how did you know that? He goes, as long as I've known you, I thought this man should combine the music with the pastorate. And uh, and John's become such a, a dear friend back in those days. It's been years since I've seen him now uh, being here. But finally, 14 years ago, uh, this church had called, and I came down, and it's a smaller church, Cameron. I've always been involved in mega churches all my life. And when, when we got here, I think the church had 23 people. Mm. And my wife, Cindy, and I, I said, honey, what do you think? And she goes, I think we're home. And I said, I was going to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so we came here in our heyday. We grew to 140 uh, due to practicing church restoration mm -hmm. of the grace of restoring those caught in unrepentant sin uh, as well as COVID and other things throughout the, the ministry here, you know, we're back to that 23 and, uh, and maybe a few more on special Sundays. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, it's been the joy of my heart that much, much more difficult than doing concerts, uh, than writing songs. But these, these people are so dedicated to the Word of God. It was a natural transition for me coming out of those mentors in my life, as well as reading these great books of theology on what this would be like here. Plus, the congregation, my secretary at that time, Miss Joyce, she is with the Lord now. She is 78 years old, and she used to bring me stacks of files and said, okay, you need to learn where we've been, where we've come from. This church was established in 1959. Uh, it's called the Cross, the Cross Church, mm -hmm. in Palm City, Florida. You ever down this way, Cameron? You got to stop in and visit us. We'd love to see you in Definitely. person. You know, but it's been great. And and you being a PK and going through local church ministry, uh, it's been a great adventure. Uh, to quote my buddy Stephen Curtis Chapman, <laughs> uh, it's been a great adventure. Um, but you know, it's you. It, it's been a heartbreak too because you walk with people in their daily lives and you clear the rocks out of the field and start to plant some seed and maybe they get moved out for a job in some other state or maybe they've left and it's due to unrepentant sin or maybe it's just you know they found another church a few hours away and took a job you know there i mean all kinds of reasons and you know, but the, the, the joy of the ministry had, had changed. Mm -hmm. And so my wife and I, uh, I play piano. She's a graduate of Juilliard. She's an amazing violinist. And we've had other musicians come and go, but we're in that smaller season again. Mm -hmm. And it's just been wonderful uh, to lead this congregation, to preach and teach to them, with them, for them every week. And so that, that transference of uh, stepping out of music full-time in ministry and bringing that to a local church focus uh, was a great transition for me. And now, after 14 years, where the leadership here, they said, hey, if other pastors can write books and do radio programs and podcasts, you can certainly write music again. And that's what led me to stay in the pastorate here but as well to write new music and a lot of that born out of the daily lives of what we go through here as a church. Yeah. Now, now for you, how has, uh, how has the day changed? I mean, as a musician, were you one that, uh, I know so many musicians <laughs> that they were like, no alarms. I'm not getting up before, you know, if you, if you yeah. schedule an interview before 11, that's on you, that's your fault. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but how, how, how is the schedule, the schedule and the day and the daily routine for you? You know, uh, coming out of the artist thing, uh, you know, we start concerts at seven, eight o'clock at night. I would do long concerts, two and a half, three hours long for me. And, uh, then by the time you get back to the hotel, order some pizza, talk with the guys and how to, how to, you know, do a little recap of the evening and meet with the pastors that brought me in or the promoters. Uh, getting to bed at one or two in the morning and getting up at nine or 10, uh, you're right. I mean, it's been that kind of transition. However, 
I st- I'm still a night owl. You know, I get to bed still now, one, two o'clock in the morning. The only difference is uh, my wife and I, we have seven kids. They're all grown up and out of the house. And we have six grandkids. But I had to get up early and learn that even in pastoral ministry. So I only require about four or five hours sleep a night, <laughs> you know. And it really is getting it. And I tell you, there there was many stories when we had a 20-something, a sizable 20-something group here that we, we grew around. Um, and literally 10 or 12 would come about 1130 at night, and I'd hear a knock at the door, and I'd go answer the door, and they would say, Pastor, can we meet and talk theology with you? We have some questions. And I said, oh, I'd be honored. They said, is Miss Cindy cooking? And she would be yelling in the background, I'll heat it up, you know. <laughs> and and here from about 1130 till about 1 in the morning, she would feed all these people that would come by the church. We'd get in the Word and just have at it. And uh, and she gets to bed a lot earlier than I do, but she's <laughs> she's an early riser. But yeah, you know, just the worldview changed with that and uh, the lifestyle of our daily lifestyle. And so now I'm here at the church. You can see a lot of the books uh, behind me and so forth. But you know what? Uh, Sometimes uh, people will knock at the door here at 7 a.m. I'll meet them for coffee at a favorite coffee shop, three baristas in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, and we get phone calls and text messages at all hours of the night. I, I always tell pastors, um, you know, whether it's four in the afternoon or four in the morning, you get that early morning call, you know, and someone's been in a car accident. Someone can't find a child and they're like, man, my teenage son hasn't come home. What's going on? Can you come over? Or someone's in the hospital and they're having surgery done or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, I want to stay fresh at any of those moments Mm -hmm. to say, okay, Lord, 24 hours a day, the work is your work, and I'm an under-shepherd of Christ. It's his church. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's changed where it's not just at nighttime or doing an interview like this from time to time. It's literally being a servant 24-7 to people that would maybe need encouragement in their lives out of the Word of God. So that's been the biggest change. And uh, and I'm just grateful, though, that the Lord has allowed me to stay here uh, this long. And someone asked me the other day, Cameron, they said, Steve, how, you know, are you going to, you know, I get offers for, from other churches from mm-hmm. time to time. And I said, I'm here. And, uh, you know, someone said, how will you leave the church? And I said, hopefully in a wooden box (laughs) and uh, just bury me out back. And uh, I have a list of pastoral numbers for people to call if that were to happen and call one of these guys. They'll come in and teach right away for a series. And as you're looking for a new pastor, um, they'll help you find, uh, you know, another man to carry on the ministry. So, yeah, really a really a great transition and just the thrill of my life to be here with this. Now, going back to uh, to, to the years gone by, uh, I mentioned about the the tapes that that I still have yeah. I, that, that I had to include on my shelf just because. And one of the things I always wondered: how hard and how many no's did you get from the from the label? When you were bringing some of the music, I mean, was there any of the times they were like, you know, oh. you're 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 a uh, you've got too much edge, too much edge. You're 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 preaching too hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what? In fact, uh, if I can, I'll I'll get back to that. This new album is kind of like the Justice album expanded, and I've had more people tell me today that if I was signed to a label. 85, 90% of these songs, they would never allow you to say what you want to say today. So I miss not having that machine, as it were, behind, but we're independent, and it's up to the Lord, you know, and uh, and all of you. So it's good. But yeah, you know what? Um, people would tell me all the time with some of these songs, uh, hey, give me a record we can sell, man. Uh, you know, you're just doing too much, and the song... Don't tell them Jesus loves them. They're like, don't you mean tell them Jesus loves them? And I said, you've got to hear the song uh, to have it make sense. And the title cut justice Mm -hmm. and recording Larry Norman's song, the great American novel, Mm -hmm. and some of these things. Even consider the cost. 
uh, which you were so gracious to mention, uh, I wrote after reading The Gospel According to Jesus by MacArthur, and almost every one of those songs were born out of that book. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's um, I know I was never going to have uh, an Amy Grant platform. We started at the same time, and uh, she's a dear gal, but I, I knew I was never going to have that kind of breadth uh, to the work just mm-hmm. based on the kind of lyrics I write and so forth. But, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the platform, even if it's smaller, uh, that the Lord has given, and I just wanted to be a faithful steward with that. But there was a reality to that. And, you know, when I came out with 107 Theses in 97, after kind of leaving the industry a bit, um, it broke my heart that a lot of the CCM labels that had uh, quite a bit of my product that I would order and take on the road and still do concerts with. Mm -hmm. And they uh, called the distributors and said, hey, we're not going there with Steve on these theses. Uh, We want the commerciality, the industry. We respectfully disagree. That's fine. I could live with that. But they literally, Cameron, sent the word down the line to say, toss it all away. I called one of the distributors and said, hey, I need to order product to take out for the next six or seven concerts. They said, we don't have any. And I said, oh, did did some bookstores order some more that I was unaware of? They said, no, we were told if you don't get rid of this product, you don't get this XYZ new tour, new album from this other artist or whatever it may be. And they said, Steve, it went in the junk heap. We literally threw it all away. And I said, why didn't you call me and give it to me if you're going to toss it? They said, we're under strict orders to shut you down. And that was hard to hear at that time. I thought every opinion in a pluralistic society camera was welcome. Um, I learned the hard way. Cancel culture existed 26 years ago. And you got shut down easy. So that's why now coming back into it, I'm anxious to see how this will be represented in these days uh, because it is a different time. Mm-hmm. And the the different times that we live in as well. I, I've, I've, I've never worked at a job where I worked on Sundays uh, until now. I, I, I work in a Walmart uh, in, and I tend to come in and I, and I work in Sunday afternoons at about two o'clock when the church crowd comes through and, you know what I what, what what my Walmart co employees that are non Christians say? Yeah. Because of the way that those Christians come in and act after their church, why why do I want any of that? Wow. Yeah, you see, I uh, I mean, I don't know who said this early on to me, but you're gonna be the only Bible people get a chance to read. You know, I mentioned this coffee shop shop, three baristas, the mm-hmm. family, Demeter and his family, uh uh from Bulgaria. And they've been making coffee for 25, 30 years, actually. And we discovered them. They're just five minutes from the church here in our house and discovered them. And uh, we would have our band of brothers meeting there every other Saturday morning. And I would I bring my books and my iPad and different things and my Bibles. And that's where I study. And uh, this is not a boast in any way, shape or form. But he told me a while back, he said, if you were not living like that book says, we wouldn't have you here. Mm. And that was the thing. It was, I would always tell the guys, we we might have 10 or 12 guys, we might have two or three guys, but to say people are watching and we'd have our Bibles open on the tables there and our coffee going and people would walk by. Sometimes they'd snicker. Sometimes they would say F you and the F didn't stand for faith. Mm. Uh, you know, and others would say, can we join you? We'd sit on down and we would talk with them. But after this number of years, it's got to be real or not. And so I'm glad you're at Walmart. That's salt and light, man. That Praise God that you're there doing that. And, and the Christians that attend, man, they need to treat people at Walmart, at Sam's Club, at Costco, at the restaurants, at the coffee shops, uh, be extra kind, uh, man. They are under. You guys are front lines today. I'm. I can't believe what I'm seeing on the news. How do I don't know if has that happened at your Walmart? We haven't had any of that craziness yet. No, haven't you? Okay, because man, what a time we live in, mm-hmm. where folks doing retail 
are just getting slammed around the country. And it's like, man, we need to go in. My wife went to a Walmart-like store uh, yesterday Mm -hmm. to get some things for our kids coming in town this week. And it was interesting. uh, A couple of the salespeople, she's always like, man, you guys are the best. Thank you for taking care of us and so forth. It doesn't take much. And you don't have to hand out a track and wear a big Jesus t-shirt and whatever, just by being gracious and kind, Mm -hmm. eventually there will be conversations to start up. It's a thing of, yeah, hey, you're the only Bible people are going to read. And I love to tell people sometime coming out of our church, I said, remember, you are now entering the mission field. Again, an old classic line. But let your life speak to that. And, uh, you know, we need to be careful of what we're saying and how we're living in front of people this way. It's a good word you've given a great question for. <laughs> and and with, with, the, with the way everybody is divided and everybody's preaching division, I mean, uh, and, and sadly enough, Steve, I, I think that, uh, that us as Christians wanted to divide uh, ourselves off too many times before and separate ourselves, but... Everybody wants to preach division and what's so, so different about everybody, but we're all going through this life together. And and, and just because we're Christians yeah. doesn't mean that we have all the answers either. No, that's right. Well, you know, I had a chance. I don't think he'd mind me mentioning his name. A guy, uh, uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner, he played Theo on the yep. Cosby show for years. And I had on one of these songs on this album, I had a chance to meet with him uh, through a mutual friend out in L.A. Uh, years ago. We were in the studio, and he liked one of the songs. We sent it to him. He came on over. He goes, I'll give you an hour. We ended up talking four and a half hours. Wow. And he's he was a big guy in terms of BLM Inc., mm-hmm. very aggressive. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a song, I still do, on this album, but it's in a different format than it initially was. It's called All Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. And we had multi-artists on this this song, and he was like, man, where do you want to preview the song? I said, Ferguson. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Ferguson? He goes, they'll kill you. And and then he changed it to, let me take that back, we'll kill you. <laughs> he said, "We, you know, he goes, you have no idea what you're stepping into. And I said, yeah, I do. And I, there was a line in the this, this song, and we rewrote it to Your Life Matters. But it's interesting, and I still have an All Lives Matter on this new record, but rewrote that one to your life matters all the artists dropped off they were intimidated by blm i still get Mm. monthly death threats from them but it was interesting i told malcolm he says you keep telling me that you love me he goes why is that are those just words i said no there's a line at the end of this of the chorus that says uh your life matters to me does my life matter to you and he said no you don't mean a hill of beans to me And he goes, why do you say that for me? I said, easy. I said, Malcolm, I know you don't believe this, but I said, God has made and created every person in his image that's ever walked this earth. I don't care what nationality, ethnicity, what nation you're from, what the degree of melanoma in your skin, melanin in your skin. Uh, I said, you are my neighbor. So I said, therefore, I am commanded to love you for no other reason you are made in the image of God. That doesn't mean I support your violence. I don't. That's not consistent with the character of God. I said, but if you come by our house at seven o'clock at night, man, my wife's an amazing cook. She'll cook all night for you. (laughs) We'll watch some movies. We'll hang out. We'll make some music. He's an incredible bass player. Mm -hmm. But I said, if you show up at three in the morning and you're not invited and you try to break in the front door of our home and hurt my family, Uh, you're going to hear, and that'll be the last thing you hear. And I have no trouble putting you down if you're trying to hurt myself or my church or my friends or my family. Mm -hmm. He goes, really? And I said, yeah. But I said, buddy, if you and I are walking along and somebody takes a nightstick to you, I'll take the hit and and I'll have you leave. You're my neighbor. You're my friend. And, And if it's done unlawfully against you, that's that's how it is. He had never heard this before. And I shared with him the song, Don't Tell Him Jesus Loves Them, Till You're Ready to Love Him Too. It He couldn't handle it. He just blew him away. So I'm with you, man. It's We need, it, it can't be a we, they thing. I mean, I am not better 
than any non-Christian. I'm better off because I've been forgiven by the gospel, uh, but I'm not better than any non-Christian. Now, doctrinal considerations among Christians are important issues, and that we have to be willing to dialogue and to talk through. But an unbelieving world, we have to be very clear uh, to represent a biblical worldview to them and a biblical ethic on the dignity of, of, of humanity. It's got to be recovered, Cameron, in our lifetime. I hope we can. And that's what this new album, in fact, is about and what some of these past songs have been for. And, and how have you seen the, the worldview outside looking at Christians change? It seems like, well, oh. from the 90s to today, it, it seemed like in the 90s, uh, Steve, you probably uh, agree. It was, it was pretty cool to be a Christian there for a while, right? Yeah, absolutely. No question. Hey, I'm a product of the Jesus movement. In the early yeah. 70s, 72 is when I came to know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And you you remember back, and even in pop music, Elton, Elton John's song, Tiny Dancer, Bernie Taupin's great lyric, Jesus freaks out on the streets, handing tickets out for God. Yep. Uh, the doobies, Jesus is just all right with me, or Spirit in the Sky. Mm-hmm. A lot of these songs, even Jackson Brown's album, Late for the Sky, yeah. or Dr. My Eyes, and some of these early songs from the late 60s, the Peace Pollution Revolution group, now we're getting saved. And it was part of the culture that we were moving into. And yeah, I mean, it was not... It was a cool thing, uh, Jesus Freaks. And so that's the thing today. What's happened, though, is people have misrepresented what the Christian life is to people. I think we've parroted the world rather than try to transform it, Mm. Uh, i.e., in the music industry. People, you know, maybe they didn't get a Grammy. uh, They weren't nominated for a Grammy. and so forth. So what did we do? We invented the Dove Awards. Mm. And I wasn't part of that. I've always spoken out against it. Um, You know, man, I'll pay 75 bucks to see Springsteen or James Taylor or some (laughs) of these great artists. With all deference to my friends, I'm not going to pay 75 bucks to see a worship artist, you know, even though that's a big thing out there. What's happened in the church, they've parroted the commerciality that the pop music field has given. And so now you can pay a hundred bucks a ticket, 150 a ticket to hear your favorite praise and worship artists perform songs of praise and worship rather than opening up the doors for free. If it's really about worship, then we should do away with the ticket prices and come together as believers and do something different. I think today's Christianity now has parried into a new thing. I don't know where you stand on this, but a new phrase that is kind of an inflated deal of the moral majority. I told Falwell years ago, if you called it the immoral majority, I could have joined. (laughs) If they would have called promise keepers, promise breakers, I could have been a a lifetime member because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I haven't arrived at this thing, man. I need grace Every day, we celebrate communion every week at our church. Why? We've got to preach the gospel to ourselves every week. We haven't arrived at this thing. I think it's Proverbs 24, 9 says, the thought of foolishness is sin. I don't know about you. I've had way too many foolish thoughts in my time, (laughs) you know? And so that's the thing. We're all still in process. Mm -hmm. But now there's a, a new movement these last few years called Christian Nationalism. And it's a thing where they're trying to marry Christianity as a theocracy with political values, and they want to reestablish Old Testament civil law and judicial penalties out of the Old Testament with Christianity and Christianize as a theocratic move the United States of America and all other nations. And I'm like, wait a second. Uh, we are to go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, not make all nations disciples. There's a difference. Uh, And so today, do we want to see godly men and women in all stratas of life? Yes, from Walmart to the White House. It would be great if we had Christians bringing biblical worldview influence. Mm -hmm. But there's no religious test to be president of the United States. 
And so Romans 13 is, if you don't honor those in power that the Lord has allowed to rise up into power, we are not honoring God. So listen, Paul was writing that when Nero was in power. Right. It wasn't that Paul was saying, I'm running for office and want to take the place of Nero, vote for me, or right. would, however they would appoint them back in Nero's day. So, you know, we have we have lost our distinctiveness of being salt and light in the culture, and at the same time to understand First Timothy 2, to pray for those in authority over us. Listen, I didn't vote for this curtain president. I don't think he's doing a good job. There are many facets. Even liberals are realizing there are some real problems with not holding to a constitutional rule of law today. Mm -hmm. However, every week at our church, we pray for President Biden. We pray for Kamala Harris. We pray for now Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House. We pray for Senate and House officials, our governor, state officials, police officers, law enforcement, the National Guard, uh, military, we are commanded to do so. We did that with President Obama. We did that with President Trump. We do that now with President Biden. Uh, vote your conscience and measure those candidates by the standard of Scripture and the Constitution. Rule of faith, rule of law. Mm -hmm. But we have got to get rid of this we-they mentality and be salt and light to it. I love it in Acts 17. Sorry to be lengthy on this, but when Paul was in uh, there in Thessalonica and then ultimately in Athens. And he said he was in the marketplace every day engaging with people. That's what you're doing at Walmart. That's what I try to do through the church mm -hmm. and at the places of entertainment that we go to, practicing hospitality, having people in. And listen, do I play gospel music in our homes sometimes for them? Yes, absolutely. But I'll play some old you know, Monk, some great jazz, yeah. <laughs> and some Nat King Cole mm -hmm. for Christmas music as well. And, you know, some Christian artists that we, we love and support dearly. We don't want to be seen as, oh, man, when you go into that home, you've got to change who you are. And let me see your true colors. Mm -hmm. Let me see who you are. And we want to walk with you in your life. And along the way, you're, you'll hear the gospel too, you know. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Now, now, Steve, uh, if, if folks want to to get the single Emmanuel and uh, any yeah. of the other music, I, I, I want to make sure and uh, and let them know where's the best place to to pick up all of uh, all of the Steve Camp catalog. Oh well, thanks, man. Yeah, the new song Emmanuel. It's on iTunes. It's it's streaming on Spotify. Uh, my website is realstevecamp.com. R E A L real Steve camp .com. Um, You can see the lyric video on the YouTube channel the same way. Um, you know, we're going to have uh, all the songs from the new album loaded up within the next uh, two months at the latest, the first single off there comes out first week of February. Uh, but yeah, we have a lyric video on this song. It was really kind of fun. Uh, Cameron, some churches reached out and said, we saw the lyric video on YouTube we're playing it at our local church because it's it's not mm -hmm. me. It's just a lyric video with some scenes behind it, and people are singing the song, and, and the lyrics are right up there. We do have a track, the same track that they'll hear on the song, uh, on the website as well. You can download that, and the whole point is sing it at your Christmas program. If oh, you're wow. busking on the street, make it part of your Christmas uh, song list. And uh, we'd be delighted if they got on and, and ordered it and uh, and so forth. But at the same time, make it part of their Christmas celebration. That's really cool. So uh, realstevecamp.com. Uh, what about the socials? Yeah. Say again, I'm sorry. What about on the socials? Oh, on the socials. Yeah, uh, we're out there all the time on X, on uh, Facebook. And you're going to hear, is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of the social platforms, Instagram, uh, TikTok is a new thing for me. I've, I want you to know I've boycotted that for the longest mm -hmm. time. And uh, someone told me the other day, get on there and engage people on issues. So I'm going to be doing some debate stuff on TikTok and trying to bring a redemptive aspect to it, man, because it's influencing a lot of people. You and I ought to go on together on TikTok and tear it up on some issue that you'd like to talk about 
and see what kind of response we'd get. I would love that. That would be you cool. Know, if, if you'd be up for it. Yeah, it's really cool. So on all the socials, on all the streaming platforms, um, it's out there. And uh, the lyric videos, uh, people said, are you going to do a real video? And I said, I have a better face for radio than I do for <laughs> music videos. But at least right now, lyric videos and uh but on all those platforms and on on social as well so that's, yeah it's fun come on board stuff. we'd love to inter, intertwine with you that's good well well steve again uh truly honored to uh to have have had the opportunity for you to cut some time out for a visit today man uh excited about the new music and uh look forward to uh to chatting again real soon my friend well, thank you. And listen, thanks for letting me just share my heart. I, I didn't mean to go so long on some of the answers, but you were so gracious. And uh, what a privilege. That's a rarity today. And uh, great to hook up with you. I hope it's not the last time, Cameron. Hope we can do this again. Well, AAA expects a record 7.5 million Americans to fly for the holidays this year. So expect even more chaos than usual. A travel expert posted a list of tips in case your checked bag gets lost. And here are four things you might want to do. Number one, buy some Apple Air Tags. Popping one in your bag has become a popular hack, but they're not exactly cheap. A four pack costs around a hundred bucks. Number two, book a direct flight. Now, hopefully you've got your tickets by now, but in general, airlines are far less likely to lose a bag when they're only putting it on one plane. Number three, take a photo of your luggage before you fly. A lot of bags look the same, so if yours gets lost, it's helpful to have a photo you can send the airline. Tying a ribbon or a unique bag tag on it also helps. And number four, print out your itinerary and put it inside your bag. If it ends up in the wrong city and the tag rips off, they'll open it up and look inside. Having your flight info in there can help you get your bag back as soon as possible. Now, obviously, we're about 10 days from Christmas, so how's your holiday shopping coming along? Now, if you're out buying gifts for the trash collector, you might be doing pretty good. Now, in a new survey, 89% of Americans say that they've bought gifts for people at the very last minute. And not surprisingly, those are usually not for your significant other or, well, you wouldn't admit it. Now, 32% of people have bought last minute gifts for friends. 27% have gone down to the wire to get gifts for extended family. And 17% said that they've shopped late for their siblings. Now, 13% of people say that they have run out of get small, last-minute gifts for postal carriers and trash collectors. And 5% have picked up a present for their kids' teachers right before the school's holiday break. Well, we do want to thank you again for joining us on this 10th episode in Season 4 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, or anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the socials on Instagram, X, formerly Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel, The Cameron Dole. Of course, if you do have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, that's going to do it for us, and I do want to say thanks to our good friend, Brandon Allen, who came up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out, and uh, hope you have a great day. Next episode, Stephen Cuoco and Ali Colleen, coming real soon.